so tonight, more broadly, we'll be talking about inflammation in your heart health. And I have no disclosures to this talk, the mandatory slide. And first, a brief outline, just because this is quite a broad topic. Um, but to really understand inflammation, we have to back up a little bit to just look at how we discovered what our quote-unquote traditional cardiovascular risk factors are. Then we'll talk about what is inflammation, because it's a very nebulous term. Um, I'll talk about why cardiologists now care about inflammation. Uh, we didn't really for a long time, and now we really do. We will talk about disease states that are linked with systemic inflammation. Uh, this is not at all all-inclusive. Um, and finally, we'll briefly touch on how to lower your inflammatory risk. So there's a certain interesting discovery of our traditional cardiovascular risk factors. And I really love this slide because in the 1940s, um, so this is President Roosevelt at the Yalta Conference, but at the 1940s, we didn't really know, didn't really have a great sense of what heart disease risk factors were. And President Roosevelt's a great example of that, where we didn't know how important blood pressure was. And President Roosevelt's blood pressure rose throughout the ages. It, 1944, 230 over 110. Later, in 1945, 260 over 150. That is well above normal. And then finally, President Roosevelt had a brain bleed and passed away with a blood pressure of 300 over 190. So we didn't really know what was important. And then Framingham came out, Framingham Heart Study, started in the 1940s and into the 60s and 70s, helped really define what, def, uh, define what our traditional heart disease risk factors were. This study and many like it helped us figure out that cigarette smoking was bad, that cholesterol levels were bad, that HDL may be good, and of course the hypertension model that I just talked about. And I think what the Framingham Heart Study told us was probably one of the most important things was about this LDL concept, that the higher the LDL, the worse your risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. And as you brought your LDL lower, your risk of having a heart problem went down. And we did a really good job for a long time. Uh, you can, this is the rates of death from heart disease over time from the 1970s up until the year 2014. And you can see, and the blue line represents men and the, the red line represents females, and you can see, starting in the year 2000, as we started to get more and more evidence and more treatment and therapies to lower our heart disease risk, targeting these traditional cardiovascular risk factors that were defined in the 60s and 70s, our deaths from heart disease dropped. But we kind of bottomed out. In 2010, things leveled off, and now there are actually some upticks, a little scary to us. And there are many, re and right now we say that 36% of deaths with the best medical therapy happened before the age of 75 due to heart disease. And the average life expectancy in the U.S. is 78.8 uh, years. So we actually still have some work to do because we think it's, if you're dying of heart disease before the age of 75, that's too young. And we probably could do better. And I think no better cartoon illustrates this point than Calvin here, who protests that he's getting a C and this is only an average job. And he got 75% of the answers correct. And in today's society, doing 75% of it outstanding, if government industry were 75 competent, we'd be ecstatic. Well, we are 75% confident in cardiovascular disease, but I think we could do better. And so one topic and one way that I'm hoping to do better is this, really this concept of systemic inflammation. And this is not all-encompassing. There are many reasons, but I think this is a very fascinating, interesting topic and one that I think is going to be one of the futures of where we're going in cardiology and how to risk reduce you. So what is systemic inflammation? It's your immune system at work, fundamentally. We have many different parts of our immune system. Uh, many different organs are involved. But we as, we as doctors fundamentally divide it up into your innate immunity and your adaptive immunity. So the innate immunity is the fast-acting stuff. You get a cut and you need inflammatory markers to come in there and help clear out all the damage from that cut. You have some acute infection. Something really bad happens to you. Your innate immune system acts first. But then it starts talking to your adaptive immune system and your adaptive immune system starts to interact with the innate. And you start to develop this memory in this memory process. So the next time you get an infection, you get a bacterial infection, a viral infection, you're adapt and it's the same ones that you had before, your adaptive immune system kicks in and remembers it. And that's actually the premise behind vaccines as well. And so we have these immune systems for a really good reason. But when they get wonky, when the really bad things happen with these immune systems, when they get overactive, that's when you start to get these immune systems attacking your body.
and it happens in rheumatologic diseases, skin diseases, and even attacks your heart as well. And that's really what systemic inflammation is and what systemic inflammation is doing to your body. It's this interaction and overactivity of your innate and adaptive immune system. And depending on which one's involved, that defines the disease state that your problem's in. But why do cardiologists care so much about inflammation? Well, we have to back up and understand a little bit about how heart disease actually develops. So this is a cross-sectional cut of your artery. The lumen is where the blood flows through. The media is just the end point of the, of the vessel. And what we're traditionally taught is that cholesterol travels through these cells lining your blood vessel into the wall of the blood vessel, and that builds up over time. And so that's why we think that cholesterol causes heart attacks. But there's an immune cell involved too. There's tons of immune cells involved. And these immune system cells are the, inflammation, the inflammatory process at work. So that immune cell that I highlighted right in this cartoon actually travels through into your blood vessel as well. It eats the cholesterol. And that process starts this inflammatory cascade of all sorts of different markers. And that whole process of the immune system interacting with the cholesterol, amongst many other processes, causes buildup in your arteries over time and causes the blockage that can cause chest pain or heart attacks. And so that's how these two things interact and why cardiologists care about inflammation. So, of course, you can only care about something if you can do something about it or, or measure it. And so when we started to develop what was or understand what was floating around in our blood in the 1920s and 30s, uh, we discovered cholesterol during that time. But we also discovered some other things floating around. And one of them that was floating around was this protein called C-reactive protein. And over time, our measurements got more and more sophisticated, could detect lower and lower values. So then we turned it high sensitivity C-reactive protein. And starting in the 1930s and really up and through today, it was what we call an acute phase reactant. And what that meant is when you had something wrong with you, when you had an infection, when you were really stressed out, when you were actually really overweight, when something was going on, that protein rose. And that protein, that's an acute phase reactant. It goes up when something bad happens to you. So CRP, or high sensitivity mirrors CRP, over time has been intimately linked to heart disease risk. The higher the level, the higher your risk of having a heart problem. No one actually knows what it does. It's made in the liver. We've been experimenting on it for decades, but we're, we're still not really sure what it does. But we know it goes up when a lot of things happen to you. And from these 30, 40, these 70, 80, 90 years of studying it, we've slowly started to figure out what the different values mean over time. Not what it does, but at least what the values mean. And there have been a lot of physicians and physician scientists in the past 20 years that have tried to understand what levels are important in your body. And what they've cited from population-based studies is that anything lower than one is what we consider low risk. And this graph says one to three average, but actually a lot of our studies that we'll talk a little bit later, when you have a, a level of two or higher, that increases your risk of heart disease. When your level's above three or higher, that increases your risk additionally. But then at some point you get to this kind of much higher levels where there's clearly some underlying process going on, you're infected, you have a cold. and So it, it, the values can be very hard to interpret because you want someone to be comfortable, stable, happy, you want them to just walk into your office and then you measure that value and that's sort of the value that they have. But this high sensitivity CRP is one marker or biomarker of inflammatory burden throughout your body and probably the best studied one that we have. And so no better study illustrates that point than this clinical trial, and I'll walk you through it. It's, um, this trial tested a certain hypothesis. Up until this point, we had been very focused on our traditional cardiovascular risk factors. We had been very focused on if you lower cholesterol and you lower blood pressure and you stop smoking, we, we really feel comfortable we're going we're gonna to lower your risk of having a heart problem. But this trial test another hypothesis. Let me take lower risk individuals. Let me take people who don't really have a good reason to be on a cholesterol lowering medication. Their cholesterol is sort of average. They're not that high risk, but let me just stratify them by their CRP. If they have a high CRP, we'll enroll them in the trial. If they don't have a higher CRP, they're not going to go on the trial. And it was a randomized trial. So half the people with a high CRP and low heart disease risk 
got a cholesterol lowering medication, Suvastatin, which was also felt to be anti inflammatory. Half got nothing. And over an average of two years, they reduced heart attacks and strokes substantially. But there was a bit of a problem with this trial. The trial was stopped early because it showed such a benefit in the cholesterol lowering medication. No one thought it was ethical to continue, which is a very important point. But when you stop a trial early, sometimes people have problems accepting it and believing it because it wasn't really what the trial was intended to do. The other argument people made is, well, of course you're going to lower heart disease risk. You're, you're lowering their cholesterol. And from that initial graph I showed you 10 slides ago, if you lower your cholesterol, it doesn't matter what level you start at, you're going to lower your chance of having a heart attack. So this trial wasn't really believed. Or it was believed, but it was controversial. But it still started to hone on this point that maybe we can restratify people by some mechanism, maybe CRP is the right one, and maybe we can lower your risk that way. Yes, so I, um, if we go back, so high-sensitivity C-reactive protein, it's a nonspecific protein that travels in your blood, uh, and it's, as we discussed, an acute phase reactant, which means it goes up when you have any problem. Um, and <clears throat> we've tried to characterize different levels of CRP in terms of what they really mean, and we've done that over years. And so we feel pretty comfortable with these numbers and these cutoffs, but of course it's all in a gradation. So last year, uh, or a year and a half ago, our concepts about how important inflammation were really changed more dramatically. Because we actually had no good therapy to reduce inflammation to potentially lower your risk of having a heart attack. We had cholesterol-lowering pills that would lower your risk of having a heart attack and also lowered CRP, but we couldn't separate out the two. We couldn't separate out lowering cholesterol and lowering CRP. But then this trial right here, this called the CANTOS trial, what it did is it tested this pathway where the end product was lowering your CRP. It lowered your systemic inflammation. And what the trial showed is by lowering your systemic inflammation independent of cholesterol levels, we reduce your risk of having a heart attack. But there are problems with this trial. If you lower your immune system, if you decrease your immune system, if you lower your inflammation, well, your immune system, that's not all bad. It's actually good too. There are people got infected. So we lowered your immune system because we wanted to reduce your risk of having a heart attack and stroke, but you also got a little infected. And so this drug actually wasn't approved. And we don't use it clinically very much at all for lowering your risk of having a heart attack. But in the cardiology world, this was, in, for us, an important proof of principle and concept that by targeting your inflammation, by targeting that inflammatory process, by targeting your immune system, we can reduce your risk of having a heart attack or stroke. And a lot of cardiologists have changed a little bit of how we think. Um, this is for secondary prevention, which means that we're going to try to prevent the next heart attack. But we've started to put people into buckets of risk, whether that risk is a residual high cholesterol level, even after treatment, a high CRP, um, high fat floating around in your, in your blood, triglycerides. We try to separate you out and target what, what's wrong. Um, but my argument for the CRP is it's nonspecific, and maybe we could even do better than that. Maybe we could move beyond CRP, and maybe we, because we don't really know why it's up, why it's down, it could be up or down for any reason. So one of the areas I'm most passionate about is these diseases that cause systemic inflammation, where it creates a really, where we kind of know what a lot of the processes going on, or we think we know. And that really brings us to, I think, the next topic of this of this talk, which is, on the underlying autoimmune conditions, which are inflammatory and which we think really increase your risk of having heart problems. And I'm going to talk about three or four today, but there are a lot. Um, and the more you look and the more you Google, you could probably find even more, but we're going to focus on three um, for tonight. So the first one is one that I have a deep passion about, um, is psoriasis. So psoriasis is a skin condition. It's an inflammatory autoimmune skin condition. That means that the autoimmune process is happening systemically and it's attacking your skin. And it causes these, erith these red scaly plaques in your body. And they look angry, they look inflamed. It's pretty common, it's one of the most common autoimmune conditions, 3% of the population. And it's got this bimodal distribution. So it, onset, it can be variable, but between the 30s to 40s and the 50s to 60s. And it's a dysregulation of both of those different types of immune response, both that fast acting one and the slow, the adaptive acting immune system as well. <clears throat> 
And the really challenging thing about psoriasis is we'll talk about the risk with heart disease, but it also raises your traditional cardiovascular risk factors. So this is, um, these patients were enrolled in a registry with psoriasis, and these are the percentage of the patients that were diagnosed with a traditional cardiovascular heart disease risk factor. 70% in this registry had high cholesterol, 50% had high blood pressure, 10% had diabetes, almost nine, over 90% had any risk factor, and about 40 to 45% had two or more risk factors. And the craziest part about this trial was a lot of them weren't known. The gray means that they were known before being enrolled in this registry, and the black means that they were detected once they were enrolled. So in this registry, about half, um, only a third were diagnosed with high cholesterol before they went in, and then someone said, oh, by the way, you're in this registry of high cholesterol. So we're clearly missing some of these patients, but the, the underlying goal, takeaway from this is that psoriasis patients have higher cardiovascular heart disease risk factors. But what's the risk of having a heart attack or stroke? So we actually didn't know the reason to this up until the early 2000s. Once cardiology had all these really great clinical trials looking at traditional heart disease risk factors and targeting these traditional heart disease risk factors, we kind of forgot that there may be other reasons of why someone could have a heart attack and stroke. And there's actually literature on psoriasis and heart disease going back to the 1960s. Maybe there'd be one study a year, sporadic, iffy. But then in 2006, this, um, this dermatology epidemiologist at UPenn looked at a UK database, and he looked at the patients that are diagnosed with psoriasis, mild or severe, and he looked at them over time. And what he found, so the y-axis is your relative risk of having a heart attack, and the x-axis is your age, that the risk of having a heart attack or stroke was 50% above match controls if you had psoriasis. And if you had severe psoriasis, your risk was even higher, threefold higher or so. And he adjusted for all the traditional cardio heart disease risk factors so that we don't think that's necessarily part of this graph. And but what it shows us is intimate connection between psoriasis, inflammation, and heart disease risk. Now, we've shown this as well. I'm not going to present too much of my own data, but I myself am very interested in this topic, and just because I couldn't resist putting in some of our own studies here from NYU. Uh, this is a biopsy from someone's skin. And the green is the blood vessel, and the red is the inflammation in the blood vessel. And I'll give you a hint. This is very low inflammation. This is just a little bit of red floating around, no big deal. This is a biopsy from someone with psoriasis, a skin biopsy, and the green is the blood vessel, and this is not at the site of where the disease is. So let's say your, your skin lesion is here, and we biopsy you someplace in, completely different. We see a lot of inflammation in that blood vessel, suggesting that the, the process in psoriasis is systemic inflammation. And then, of course, if we biopsy your, where the uh, disease is on your skin, we see tons of red everywhere, meaning that the inflammation is, is throughout the entire skin, which is what we'd expect. Now, others have looked at this very well in depth, and um, there's one person, one cardiologist in particular at the NIH has really made his career out of this, understanding the connection between psoriasis and inflammation in the vasculature. In these scans, so the, the, there's a control person, and there's a patient with psoriasis, and there's a lot of dark uh, on the blood vessels, that's number one. So the dark is inflammation, meaning that the, there's inflammation in the blood vessels from this patient. The liver's inflamed, the skin is inflamed, as we'd expect. This patient has psoriasis. And the joints are inflamed. This patient had something called psoriatic arthritis, where the joints are inflamed as well. And what he's shown, and this is honing in on the aorta, or the large blood vessel that we have, that in a control person, some without psoriasis, and some with psoriasis, the aorta is inflamed as well, suggesting, again, this a more definitive link between the inflammation and psoriasis and aortic inflammation as well. And we'll get back to different studies of how to treat this, but we're going to stop there for now. We're going to move on to another disease. It's overlap rheumatoid arthritis, which is, um, has a lot of overlap. These inflammatory diseases have a lot of overlap. And so in rheumatoid arthritis, this is 1% uh, in the Caucasian populations. And this is the most common inflammatory disease of the joints. Uh, women are more highly affected than men. And the peak age of onset is in the 50s and 70s. And again, this is an inflammatory response, somewhat similar to psoriasis, but with some core differences. The core difference being we think this, the inflammatory process starts in the synovium. And it's a disease primarily of the joints, but with a lot of systemic manifestations as well.
Um, and this disease is actually, in terms of the heart problems, is actually more well studied than psoriasis. And we've over time figured out that the inflammation and in rheumatoid arthritis can affect not just the coronary arteries of the heart right here with a similar inflammatory process to psoriasis, but it can cause some other problems as well. Um, a, large, a large amount of patients actually get fluid around their heart. The majority of the time, this is totally inconsequential. We don't even know it's there unless we look for it. It doesn't really matter, but suggesting this inflammation is systemic. Uh, you can get inflammation. It's not just fluid, but inflammation around the heart. It's a little less common, but it can be very painful and can lead to some consequences. You can also get a weak heart. Your heart normally beats at 65%. You don't want anything more, or you don't want much less. But these hearts can get weaker to 30%, 25%. And then you can also get blockages in the arteries as well. And so what we say with rheumatoid arthritis is that your heart disease risk goes up at 50%. And these patients are more likely to have heart attacks, strokes, and congestive heart failure as well. And in terms of trying to quantify this risk, a lot of us know that diabetes is a risk factor for heart disease. And if you look at this graph, this is events over time. And the non-diabetics controls have this level of, uh, of having an event. And the lower the line, the worse it is. And the patients with diabetes and the patients with rheumatoid arthritis have superimposed lines. So just in the risk of having a heart problem is similar whether you have rheumatoid arthritis or diabetes. Now, I think this study was a little trumped up. Um, I don't know if it's as bad as that, but I think the, the implications still hold. And one of the very challenging things about rheumatoid arthritis, there's some nuances behind managing the cardiovascular manifestations. And this is very, we think this is unique to rheumatoid arthritis, so we're not sure. But the actual, the cholesterol levels go down when you're inflamed in rheumatoid arthritis. They have a name for it. It's called the lipid paradox. So the orange line is the, um, uh, in, the inflammation. And the blue, oh, sorry, the orange line is the cholesterol. And the blue line is the inflammation. And as the inflammation goes up and your RA becomes active, the cholesterol levels go down. And then as you fix the inflammation, your cholesterol levels start to rise again. And we think this is related to both production and clearance of the cholesterol and how it relates to the inflammation going on specific to, to rheumatoid arthritis. But that's actually led to one of the few solid recommendations we have in the RA world for managing these patients is we're not supposed to re react to your cholesterol levels until you're actually con your disease is controlled. So if we see really wonky lipids or we see quote unquote normal cholesterol, we, we don't really think much of it. Once you're on a good treatment therapy for your RA, your cholesterol level should rise. And then we say, okay, this is what your true cholesterol level is. Now we're gonna treat it. So finally, we have the last inflammatory disease I'm gonna talk about today, uh, systemic lupus methemonis. We have an active research program here uh, with some very established rheumatologists as well as some of our cardiologists. Um, and the prevalence is not as common as the other two diseases, but it is you know, 20 to 150 cases in 100,000. Women are much more affected than men, and primarily younger women, um, between the ages of 16 to 55, median age of onsets in the 40s. And it's, again, an inflammatory response. And you notice I kind of lump in innate and adaptive immune system to everything, but this seems to be very well antibody um, antigen-mediated. Um, it has a much more what we call adaptive immune response than, than innate. And we say lupus is the great mimicker. It can get you anywhere. Uh, the skin, the lungs, the heart, uh, the mouth, joints, hair, everything. So you can only imagine that it would affect your heart as well. It has some very unique manifestations in the heart. So the first is it can cause these little platelet clumps that go into your valves uh, called Lipman sacs and arcoditis. It's not infectious, uh, but they remain there, and they usually don't cause much problems, or they can be confusing if we're trying to figure out what else is going on. Um, you also get this inflammation around the heart more commonly than rheumatoid arthritis. You can get a weak heart, and you can also have increased blockages as well. And so in this one graph, I guess it doesn't represent as well as I would have liked, but the black line is the controls. This is risk of heart failure over time. And this is the controls. And as you go up in the different types of lupus manifestations, your risk of heart failure goes up over time to about 12% uh, relative increased risk um, as you get older and you have lupus.
And this is actually one of the first studies to ever come out looking at the heart disease risk of lupus. And one of the challenging parts about studying these pa patients with lupus is that the registries aren't very robust up until recently. So we actually didn't have great data. But this was a study published about 14, 15 years ago. In the green is the lupus, the, I guess, light blue are the controls. And this is the incidence of, uh, or the prevalence of plaque in your arteries. You can see that prevalence is much higher, whoops, excuse me, even in the age of 40, 50, 60, and so on in the lupus patients over the controls. Again, kind of going in this underlying concept, these inflammatory diseases do increase your risk of heart problems later in life. But um, hopefully the question now comes to, well, so what? How do we fix this? Where do we start? And that's where hopefully we come in. So the first way we start with any of diseases is we start like you didn't have the disease, and we calculate your average risk to begin with. And so one of our um, tools that we have to do this are these risk scores, and maybe some of you are familiar with it, where we plug in your age, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, if you have diabetes, if you smoked, and we get this percent risk. And this percent risk can run anywhere from zero to uh, greater than 20, greater than 30. And depending on where your risk falls, that helps dictate what therapies we should or shouldn't put you on or what recommendations we should make, including lifestyle and, and diet and exercise, which again are the core components to any risk reduction strategy or recommendation. And depending on where you fall in this percentage, we then look at other things that may or may not increase or lower your risk. So if you're in this set five to seven and a half, five to ten percent range, we're starting to look at other things that may make you more risky for having a heart problem, and we should think about fixing it. And one of the really amazing things is that our new guidelines actually talk about this for the first time ever. Our guidelines, our societies in cardiology completely ignored psoriasis, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis in terms of how to factor that into risk stratification. And as of 2018, we now have recommendations recognizing that psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis are risk factors and that we should do something about it. And the first thing we do about it is we actually use it as a way to perhaps put, give you therapy earlier than we would have. And this is critically important because what I showed you earlier on is that if you have this inflammatory risk and we give you a cholesterol-lowering medication, even though your cholesterol is normal, it still may reduce your risk of having a heart attack or stroke. And this is evidence-based. So that's why these recommendations stand. I think they're really important. And it's not just the cardiology community. It's also the dermatology community as well. So the dermatology community just came out with recommendations. The Europeans were ahead of us. The Europeans came out with recommendations for RA like five or six years ago. Very controversial, but the dermatology community in the U.S. has caught on. And what they recommend is taking that risk score and multiplying it by 1.5. increase So giving you a higher score and thus suggesting as a cardiologist, as a practitioner, to have an earlier initiation of cholesterol-lowering medications. Now, these recommendations are controversial. This multiplier of 1.5 has been shown over and over in the rheumatoid arthritis literature to underestimate or overestimate your actual risk, depending on what your disease severity is. But nevertheless, I think this is a really important first step. <clears throat> and it also cues the community in that we need to do something about this. But I always say start with the really easy stuff. And this is another clinical trial from the psoriasis community where they enrolled patients and they looked at their risk factors. For It was an eventual therapy uh, trial, but it doesn't matter. And at least 90% of them had one or greater heart disease risk factor. And that's in this column right here. And when you look at how well their disease risk factors were controlled, it was not very good at all. The amount with hemoglobin A1C under... 7% that's considered good was just over half, meaning we had a lot of work to do. The number of people with controlled blood pressure, only 30%. The number of patients with a low cholesterol level, 50%. Those who had all three of these risk, traditional risk factors managed, 75 to 8%. So it's really easy and not controversial at all to start with the easy stuff. Just screening people for our, our traditional heart disease risk factors who we think are a higher risk for having heart problems because of RA, psoriasis, lupus, and doing something about it. That's half the job that we do every day, just recognizing it and treating it. But then, of course, we have the question, if we target your underlying disease, 
will we reduce your heart disease risk? If we control the inflammatory process that's causing your whole manifestation, will we reduce the risk of having heart problems? And we unfortunately don't know the answer to that. And that's what I'm trying very, very hard to study. We have really great studies where we just looked at people over time that suggest yes. If we lower your inflammatory, if we lower the inflammation through targeting your psoriasis, targeting your RA, targeting your lupus, we're going to lower your risk of having a heart attack. Those are just observational, which means just follows you over time. But cardiologists don't like that. Cardiology, we have the best data for randomized placebo-controlled trials. We have outcomes. You don't really care if your cholesterol is high. You do, but you actually care if something happens because of that high cholesterol. You don't really care if your blood pressure is high. You happen if something happens because of your high blood pressure, like a stroke or a heart attack. So we, like in the cardiology world, look at outcomes. And we unfortunately do not have very good outcome data for controlling the inflammation to reduce your risk of having a heart attack and stroke. I deeply believe that it's true. I think that our studies will eventually be true. But it's very hard to recommend that right now, which is why um, we say that to look at these modifiable risk factors like blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, and control is the best you could. But there's one more aspect that I left out that I think Dennis would be very upset at me if I didn't talk about, and that's fighting inflammation through food, through diet, and exercise. Um, and I'm going to... Sure. Sure. So, sure. Um, these are just pulled from internet. I mean, I, a lot of this is... Um, maybe don't highlight the anti-inflammatory foods. Maybe highlight the inflammatory foods because these are very not controversial. For example, fried foods... Um, refined carbs, lard, processed meat. These are all ones that I feel pretty comfortable saying um, are what we consider pro-inflammatory, regular sodas. And I think it's, it's very uncontroversial that um, these types of foods are, are, are bad for you. Is there a way we can get a copy of that? Sure, I think we can. Sure. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Uh, and for Valley, this was pulled from the Harvard um, School of Public Health website. So there is some validity to this. This is not, you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there about which foods are going to save your life if you only eat those foods. And I don't want to be a Charlton, um, uh, but this was pulled from a legitimate uh, 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 hospital. So the one thing I did want to focus on was some of our diets that are just really wonderful um, for reducing heart disease risk have also been shown to be anti inflammatory. And cardiologists, um, there's, Obviously, diet is very controversial in terms of what's the perfect diet, what diet should you be on. But many of us in the cardiology world are feeling more and more comfortable with trying to recommend at least some uh, a Mediterranean diet or having a conversation about the Mediterranean diet. Uh, and that's because um, it has outcomes data. In, in a randomized controlled trial, patients who are randomized to a Mediterranean diet, which I'll talk about in a sec, compared to a low-fat diet, had a reduced risk of, of a stroke and heart attack. Um, now, there has been some controversy around that in the past year or so in terms of study design, but um, a lot of the results we still think hold. But the one I wanted to focus on was that if in this, in this compilation of uh, five clinical trials, if you stuck to the Mediterranean diet, you lowered your inflammation, you lowered your CRP. So I think that's a really important point about sort of putting in some evidence-based uh, practice into what types of diet we recommend. And the Mediterranean diet is one that's easily Googleable. Um, you know, but it's one that's focused on, again, um, this one in particular was focused on extra virgin olive oil, um, uh, non-refined carbohydrates, so f foods with a lot of high fiber, limiting your red meat intake, and, and having a high level of, um, of fish intake as well, amongst many other recommendations. And so when you follow this diet, and we'll just focus on A for now, um, this is, again, this is the y-axis is the rate of having a heart attack or stroke. And the x-axis is time to event. And the control diet is a low-fat diet. That's the blue. And the, uh, I guess, green and orange are the Mediterranean diets. And you found that you had a lower rate of heart attack or stroke if you stuck to the Mediterranean diet. And what's interesting and something really to think about moving forward is there's two parts to the Mediterranean diet. There was a part supplemented with nuts, and there was a part supplemented with extra virgin olive oil. And surprisingly, if you look on slide B, it was the extra virgin olive oil component that had a reduction in total mortality. Um, you know, some people think it's due to the phenols or the anti-inflammatory effects of the phenols from the extra virgin olive oil. Who knows? Um, but I think at least, you know, a lot of us believe the best diet is still the one you can stick to. That's my personal preference. But I think the Mediterranean diet um, has some evidence behind it, and it's a little more forgiving and a little more fun than some of the other ones out there, which is why the one you can stick to. Yeah. 
Um, not necessarily Dennis. That's fighting words for for Dennis, but um, uh, and a lot of people. But if you can lose weight, and you know, and anyway. Um, so to that end, uh, what we've done at NYU, which is unique to one of only two or three in the country, or actually the continent, there's is have this cardio room cardiovascular risk re reduction clinic. And we're focused on these rheumatologic diseases and how we can help you modify risk. Because uh, there's a lot more nuanced conversations that go into this, especially when we talk about um, disease modifying agents and how it reduces your risk of having a harder problem. Um, but we're really focused on people with these diseases and what we can do to help. Uh, because a lot of this information I presented about can be scary, um, but it, it's not meant to be because uh, we have ways to, to help. We have ways just by recognizing, by treating. And um, I really think we can do a lot of people a lot of good. And this is sort of an under-researched field that we're hoping to improve on. So thank you very much. Um, and I'll take any questions.